Hey there, Internet. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Yes, it's Patreon review time again. If you're interested in my Patreon, it's linked below. One of the reward tiers is to request your own review, like a patron's done today. Now, last week, I reviewed Clue a black comedy murder mystery, which on the surface would seem to be everything I hate in a movie. But it turned out that Clue was a joyously enjoyable farce with a ridiculous third act that just made everything so much better. I only bring this up because our patron sponsored review this week concerns another movie that on the surface of it wouldn't seem to have a chance of hell of getting anywhere near my house of love. But we'll see. Anyway. I present to you this week's Patreon-sponsored review, Life Force. Released in 1985, Life Force is a sci-fi horror of quite the schlockiest kind. A crew of cosmonauts find a trio of humanoids aboard a supposedly alien ship, in the tail of Halley's Comet no less. But oh dear, these humanoids are in fact Alien Energy Vampires. Directed by Tobe Hooper, and produced by the infamous Golan and Globus of the Canon Group, what chance does this movie stand of making it anywhere near my house of love? There's only one way to find out! Because again, this one's a first watch. Yes, I've only seen it to bring it before you today. Also, I should mention that this is the international cut, which was also the director's preferred cut if that makes any difference. So grab your stakes and crucifixes, and your spacesuit, as we discover space vampires of an altogether different sort in... Life Force! The crew of the HMS Churchill are on their way to explore Halley's Comet. But shock! There's a spaceship in the tail! A small search party disembarks to investigate. Now, I've never been into space, outside of video games that is, but I was always impressed by what human game developers could come up with for alien architecture. One can only imagine what real aliens would create. Colonel Carlson discovers three humanoids in suspended animation. Another shuttle is dispatched to rendezvous with the Churchill. But the rescue team finds the Churchill wrecked and desolate. But the rescued humanoids are just fine. And one of them ends up on the dissection table back on Earth. Lucky for her then, that she awakens. Ooh, this scene brings back some painful memories, man. Don't ask, it's a six-shot story. But beware the alien's kiss. The facility director rushes to the scene, but oh dear. Now, there's probably a metaphor here that's sailing right over my head. The girl finds her way out of the complex, and onto the streets of London. Of course, the Space Research Center does have security guards. But she's a space energy vampire. She has powers. So they're probably not going to be much use against her. An SAS colonel arrives to investigate. And we witness an interesting conversation with another scientist, Dr. Falada. Now, I mention the good doctor for three reasons. One, because he's played by veteran British actor Frank Finlay. Two, because he's rather mad. And three, because he finds the weapon to defeat the aliens later on. But then the other two wake up. Luckily, a couple of quick-thinking soldiers put paid. But the girl's first victim isn't quite dead. And his rejuvenation is not without cost. <laughs> or indeed very long-lasting. But shock! There was a survivor of the Churchill. And Colonel Carlson relates the story of what happened to the rest of the crew. 
Why was it that the Churchill ended up burned and desolate? Well, they got the three humanoids back to the Churchill, but then someone sabotaged the guidance and comms. And one by one, the space vampires, without even moving, drained the crew of their life essence. All except Carlson. But why Carlson? Oh, you'll find out. But not just yet. But in the night, the girl appears to Carlson in his dreams. She's left her mark on him. Which Dr. Falada uses to spy on her. So yeah, apparently she can possess people. It's a thing. But her real body is hidden away. Where? St. Paul's Cathedral. But that's not revealed until much later in the movie, and neither you nor I care about that, so let's move on. The trail leads north to Thurlstone Asylum. And Carlson's interrogations may be unorthodox, but they lead us to the girl's latest host. And from that host, she confesses her love for Carlson. But this whole trip was just a wild goose chase. Luckily, Dr. Falada has the cast iron cure for space energy vampirism. And Carlson comes clean about what really happened aboard the Churchill. Who trashed the comms and guidance and erased the data tapes? Carlson. And why? Love, in a word. A kind of all-encompassing genetic level love that mere humans like us could never understand. Because Carlson isn't one of us. He's one of them. Back in London, chaos reigns. Our heroes are then quarantined at a staging area. Carlson escapes to find the girl. And so, Tom Carlson comes to end the plague of vampirism. But Kane races across London, on foot, to deliver the cast iron cure. And so our movie ends as Carlson stakes both himself and the girl, and the space vampires return to the stars. So that was Life Force, a schlocky movie with far too much female nudity. But if for nothing else other than its bombastic score, I'm still going to put this one into my house of love. This is definitely not a family film, which is no bad thing in itself, and I dare say that a fair amount of what gave this movie its 18 rating had to do with the girl spending damn near the entire movie stark naked, so it's certainly not light on nudity, but it does have some good performances. Now I tend to base a lot of my judgments on likability, and while it often seems to be in short supply in higher rated movies, these characters aren't eminently hateable, or mean-spirited, only driven, being that the movie is mostly carried on the shoulders of Steve Railsback's Carlson and Peter Firth's Kane, at least in the second half, the two leads are at least engaging enough to make you root for them. Add in a dry yet watchable turn from Frank Finley as Dr. Falada, and an extended cameo from Patrick Stewart, and there's plenty for the theatre nerds to love. A pity then that Matilda May gets so little screen time. But not for the reasons you might think. Her unnamed villain is another ethereal presence, an existential threat, rather than a more pressing vampiric mistress of the night, which I suppose is more of a confounding of my expectations rather than any fault on the filmmaker's part. The flow of the movie is straightforward enough, if unspectacular feeling, the Earth-like gravity on the shuttle is explained away quickly, and the first few shots of the alien ship are fantastic model work, but once we're relegated to chasing a ghost, I feel like the movie meanders a little, but the ending is engaging, if only because of the effects work. And we have to mention the score, written by Henry Mancini and performed brilliantly by the London Symphony Orchestra, bringing the ethereal beauty of the stars alongside the madness of a ruined London. And I would have at least put a leotard on the poor space girl. In summary then, it's a sci-fi vampire flick, sure, but the cast is solid, the effects are good, and Matilda May, with or without clothes, is definitely alluring. 
It's a solid 80s horror acuna from the Canon Stable. So thank you to my Patreon patrons for continuing to donate, and thank you to my viewers for continuing to watch. If you liked this video, why not consider subscribing, and ring the notification bell to be notified of when I upload. And if you want to be extra awesome, check out my Patreon and Ko-fi links in the links below. Who knows, next time it could be your request I choose to review. But for now, I've been Funky Monkey, wishing you good days and great entertainment. So long! folks.